the death of so great a thing should make a greater crack. The round world should have shook lions into civil streets and citizens to their dens. The death of Antony is not a single doom. In the name lie a moiety of the world. William Shakespeare, the English playwright, wrote those words in his immortal play, Antony and Cleopatra, about the death of the Roman military leader Marcus Antonius, Mark Antony. Cleopatra VII, the once ruler of Egypt and one of the last of the line of Ptolemy, had not just been Mark Antony's lover, but also the lover of Julius Caesar, the first of the Roman emperors. Antony and Cleopatra are both said to have died in August of 30 BC, a story that's relatively well known. But the fate of Cleopatra's four children, one with Caesar and three with Mark Antony, seems to disappear from history upon the death of their famous parents. In fact, it was because of one of her children that Octavian decided to declare war on Antony and Cleopatra, putting an end to the era of the Roman Republic and ushering in the Imperial Age. It is history that deserves to be remembered. The Egyptian dynastic line of Ptolemy was founded by one of Alexander the Great's companions, Ptolemy I Soter. Many of the pharaohs never learned to speak any language other than Greek, but Cleopatra VII was well known for her ability to converse and write in other languages. Plutarch wrote, she could readily turn to whatever language she pleased, so there were few foreigners she had to deal with through an interpreter. Among the groups Plutarch claimed Cleopatra could converse with in their own languages were the Ethiopians, Troglodytes, Hebrews, Arabs, Syrians, Medes, and Parthians. He goes on to say that many of the pharaohs didn't even bother to learn Egyptian, the language of the people they ruled. Plutarch did not say that Cleopatra spoke Latin, but his audience would have already known that she did, because it was Rome and her armies who kept Cleopatra in power. First, the Romans reinstated Cleopatra on the throne besides her brother, Ptolemy XIII, after Ptolemy's supporters had driven her into exile. Then the Romans defeated Ptolemy's armies when they tried to place Cleopatra's sister, Arisone, on the throne instead of accepting Rome's arrangement for a joint rulership of Ptolemy and Cleopatra. Ptolemy XIII, pharaoh of Egypt, drowned during the battle, perhaps while trying to escape. Afterwards, Cleopatra's younger brother, Ptolemy XIV, was now declared co-ruler by the Romans. While fighting to hold her throne, the Roman general Julius Caesar and Cleopatra became lovers, and she bore him a son on June 23rd of 47 BC. He was called Ptolemy the 15th, Philopater, Philometer, Caesar, also nicknamed Caesarian or Little Caesar. Some contemporary historical sources express doubt about whether Caesarian was actually the son of Caesar, but this may have been for political reasons rather than reflecting reality. Julius Caesar already had a wife in Rome, and though Cleopatra was co-ruler of Egypt, she was considered a foreigner, not Roman, and therefore not worthy to be the mother of the heir of Caesar. When Cleopatra brought her son to Rome in 46 BC and they stayed in Caesar's villa, the Encyclopedia Britannica says Caesar officially recognized Caesarian as his child. That was an unpopular move with the Romans for the reasons already stated, but also because Caesar had already had an official heir, his great nephew, Gaius Octavius Therinus, also called Octavian. But Caesar must have acknowledged Cleopatra's child in some way because he was allowed to use the name Caesarian, a patronym which tied him directly to Caesar's own family. Caesarian was said to resemble Caesar in his facial features and some of his mannerisms. He may also have had epilepsy, an affliction Caesar was also said to have suffered. Interestingly, epilepsy was viewed by the Romans not as a frightening unknown affliction, but as a sign of the blessing of the gods. They believed Alexander the Great had also experienced epilepsy, and so, if you or your child had it, the gods were honoring you as they had honored him. Other historians cast doubt on whether Caesarian suffered from epilepsy and argue that Cleopatra probably made him up to look more like Caesar just to make it more palatable to claim that he was Caesar's son. Some historians, in fact, question whether Caesar himself suffered from epilepsy. When researching ancient history where so much has been lost and so much is based on legend, separating fact from fiction can be difficult. But when Caesar was assassinated on the Ides of March in 44 BC, Cleopatra fled Rome to save not just her child, but herself, having just lost her most powerful protector. She returned to Egypt, where her co-ruling brother conveniently disappeared, probably put to death by Cleopatra, and she put Caesarion on the throne as Ptolemy XV. He was only three years old, so Cleopatra still held the reins of power. She encouraged others to view her as the goddess Isis on Earth, the slain Caesar as Osiris, and Caesarion as their son Horus. 
Cleopatra supported the cult of Isis, a religion centered around the veneration of a maternal goddess who, among other things, supported marriage, parenthood, and women. It was not unheard of for pharaohs to associate themselves with the gods, as the male pharaohs were generally seen as the embodiment of Ra, the Egyptian god of the sun. Isis, on the other hand, was more closely aligned with the moon, and lent Cleopatra an air of mysterious charisma, perhaps more than ever before. This charisma served her well in the years following the death of Caesar. Leading Romans were fighting over control of the empire with Caesar's allies, including Octavian and Antony, facing off against Gaius Cassius Longinus and Marcus Junius Brutus. Cassius and Brutus are the most remembered for leading the plot to assassinate Caesar. Antony defeated Cassius and Brutus in the Battle of Philippi in October of 42 BC. He summoned Cleopatra to Tarsus to inform her that he planned to use Egypt as a base for his navies in order to fight against Rome's enemies in Asia. He also needed wealth to support the campaign of which Egypt had in abundance. According to one contemporary historian, Cleopatra answered Antony's call in an elaborate ceremonial fashion, traveling in an ornately decorated barge. She dressed as Isis and formally greeted Antony as the god Dionysus. Antony, like Caesar, was apparently charmed by Cleopatra. They had twins together in 40 BC and named them Alexander Helios and Cleopatra Selene II. Helios and Selene were Greek for sun and moon, and the name Alexander was in honor of Alexander the Great. Four years later, Antony and Cleopatra had a son together, Ptolemy Philadelphus, in 36 BC. His name translates to Ptolemy the Brother-Loving. Like Caesarion, whom Cleopatra believed could rule both Rome and Egypt, Cleopatra had high hopes for her children. In 34 BC, Antony and Cleopatra held an event called the Donations of Alexandria, in which they gave lands and titles to their children. They dressed as the god Dionysus and goddess Isis and sat on golden thrones before the people of Alexandria in a show of wealth and power. During the ceremony, some of the lands given to the children of Cleopatra included Alexander Helios, who was named King of Armenia, Parthia, and Medea, near modern-day Iran. Alexander was engaged to a princess of Medea for a time, but after his parents' eventual defeat, she married another king. Cleopatra Selene received Cyrenica, an eastern portion of modern-day Libya, and Libya. Ptolemy Philadelphus, who was only two at the time, was given Syria and Cilicia, a coastal region of Asia Minor located to the northeast of the Isle of Cyprus. But the declarations that brought the most trouble to Antony and Cleopatra were the gifts bestowed upon Caesarion. They claimed that he was legitimate son and heir of Julius Caesar, and therefore a god, since Caesar had been deified by the Roman Senate after his death. They styled Caesarion as King of Kings and King of Egypt. Meanwhile, Octavian, back in Rome, was not pleased with Antony and Cleopatra's ostentatious ceremony. His fortune and political power came from being the heir of Julius Caesar. His was the name that had been read in Caesar's will. Octavian could not allow Antony and Cleopatra to declare their child the legitimate heir without losing everything he had built since his great-uncle's death. He began what might now be called a political smear campaign in Rome, turning the Senate and people against Antony, who was so far away in Egypt with Cleopatra. For starters, Octavian accused Antony of abandoning his Roman wife, Octavia, for a foreign queen. Which is true. Octavia also happened to be Octavian's sister. He believed Antony to be guilty of many things, including starting wars without the permission of the Senate, giving conquered lands to his children that should have gone by tradition to the armies of Rome. And worst of all, he said Antony had turned his back on Rome and her traditions in order to become Egyptian. One need only look at the donations of Alexandria to see that Antony was no longer Roman. It wasn't a Roman tradition to sit on a golden throne or dress as a Greek god, he said. Because of these transgressions, Octavian proclaimed Mark Antony should not be viewed with either respect or trusted with political power. Antony responded to these accusations by divorcing Octavia and accusing Octavian of forging the papers that made him Caesar's heir. The Senate of Rome responded in turn by removing Antony from power and declaring war on Cleopatra in 32 BC. To declare war against the Queen of Egypt was political maneuvering by the Senate, so it did not seem as if Rome was going to war against Antony, who still held sway in some Roman circles. Despite their efforts to appease the pro-Antony crowd, approximately a third of the Senate defected and met Cleopatra and Antony in Greece. War with Octavian could not be avoided. The naval battle of Actium between the forces of Octavian and Antony and Cleopatra was fought on September 2nd, 31 BC, off the western coast of modern-day Greece. Though Antony's 500 ships were larger, Octavian's 250 vessels were fast and easily outmaneuvered Antony's big ships. 
especially after they lured the cumbersome fleet away from the shore and out into the deeper waters. Octavian may have experienced such quick success because, according to one Roman historian, one of Antony's generals defected shortly before the battle and brought Antony's battle plans with him. Cleopatra had 60 ships in reserve behind Antony's fleet, but suddenly, when the tide seemed to be turning against Antony, Cleopatra's ships put up their sails and began what appeared to be a tactical retreat. Antony sailed after Cleopatra, leaving his men to face Octavian and defeat. Strangely, Antony and Cleopatra returned to Alexandria and threw one of their legendary parties to celebrate Caesarion's coming of age. Antony sent money and an offer to Octavian to retire as a private citizen in Greece. Octavian refused. Cleopatra offered to resign from her throne and begged Octavian to allow her son to rule Egypt. He rejected this offer as well. Cleopatra may have tried to send Caesarion away for his protection, but Octavian lured him back with promises of the throne of Egypt. On August 1st, 30 BC, Octavian marched his legions into Alexandria. After hearing reports that Cleopatra was dead, Antony tried to end his life, but only succeeded in severely injuring himself with his sword. When he found out she was still alive, he commanded his servants to bring him to her, where he died. Cleopatra, unwilling to be marched through Rome in chains as part of Octavian's triumph, killed herself as well. Caesarion, Cleopatra's eldest son, was 17 years old when Octavian put him to death and ended the direct line of Julius Caesar. Alexander Helios, Cleopatra Selene, and Ptolemy Philadelphus were wrapped in heavy chains and forced to march through Rome behind an effigy of their mother with an asp rest around her arm. Some historians recorded the Roman crowd expressing sympathy for the orphans as the metal links were too heavy for the children to carry. Octavian, later known as Augustus, gave Cleopatra's three surviving children to Octavia, his sister and Antony's divorced wife. She raised and educated them with her own offspring, completing one final task as Antony's wife. There is no record of what happened to Alexander Helios or Ptolemy Philadelphus. Their lost history, no record of them being married or having children. But their sister, Cleopatra Selene, was married by Augustus to King Juba II of Mauritania, one of the client states of Rome. She encouraged him to be a patron of the arts, of science, of history, perhaps in memory of her well-educated mother. They had a son together. She named him Ptolemy. Historians disagree as to the date of Cleopatra Selene's death, which may have occurred anywhere from 5 to 8 AD, but most agree that this eulogy by the poet Crinogorus was written for her. The moon herself grew dark, rising at sunset, covering her suffering in the night, because she saw her beautiful namesake, Selene, breathless, descending to Hades. With her she had had the beauty of her light in common, and mingled her own darkness with her death. I hope you enjoyed this episode of The History Guy, short snippets of forgotten history between 10 and 15 minutes long. And if you did enjoy, please go ahead and click that thumbs up button. If you have any questions or comments or suggestions for future episodes, please write those in the comment section. I will be happy to personally respond. Be sure to follow The History Guy on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and check out our merchandise on teespring.com. And if you'd like more episodes on forgotten history, all you need to do is subscribe.